Disruptors and curious minds, happy new year and welcome to the first episode of Thinking on Paper in 2024. My name is Jeremy Gilbertson. With me as always is Mark Fielding and we are here to unpack the intersection of emerging tech and culture. A uh, quick brief shout out to our really good friends at Ripple, W-R-I-P-P-L-E, Marketing's On Demand Talent Platform. They are stacking teams of interdisciplinary experts just for you. 3,000 vetted solopreneurs uh, at your disposal and ready. Check them out at WRIPPLE.com. Without further ado, let's jump right in, Mark. We've got an awesome topic and an awesome guest, but we want to change our perspective on it a little bit, don't we? We, we want to change our perspective on it. Um, and I can't believe we're starting 2024, the season two, with somebody who's going to bring so much thoughtfulness on the future of tech. So I'm very excited. Um, our guest is Thomas Frey. He's a futurist and founder of the Da Vinci Institute. Um, he's a writer. His works appeared in the New York Times, the Huffington Post, Times of India, USA Today, US News, World Report, Popular Science, many more. He's a speaker. He's appeared at TEDx. Um, he worked at IBM for 15 years. He started 17 businesses. And yeah, he's kicking off season two of Thinking on Paper. So welcome, Thomas Frey, to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's a, it's a pleasure. And I wanted to start off with an article that I recently read on, it was on The Guardian of London, but it was about movies set in 2024 old movies like Highlander 2 was set in 2024 and there's some other films and they're all very bleak. They're all full of doom and gloom and essentially 2024 in these movies is the beginning of the end. I think the article is actually called the beginning of the end, but we want to move away from that dystopia and take that maglev train to utopia and get an optimistic first view of 2024 from someone who thinks about this all the time. Yeah. So I don't know if you could use that as an introduction. Yeah. Give us the optimistic view for 2024. Well, Thomas. it used, used to be that all the all the science fiction movies were in the horror section of uh, the movie uh, movie world. And and they always made technology the bad guy. And I, I, I don't like that. Technology is uh, neither good nor bad. It's it, it is what we make it. And it can certainly can be used for bad things, but we have we have lots of interesting things coming around the corner. And one of one of the things I've been telling people is that this fear of the fear of jobs going away, um, the things that the technology that's disrupting our jobs is the exact same technology that's going to be creating all the new jobs in the future. So if we see a technology that's disrupting our, our workplace. We need to embrace that. We need to uh, latch onto it and work with it and learn as much as we can about it, whether it's robotics or AI, whether it's uh, new healthcare, um, uh, quantum computing, whatever it might be. That's where all the new jobs are going to come in the future. So um, it would uh, be, be in our best interest to know as much as we can about those topics. That's such a great way to think about it. And uh, hey, quick shout out to Kamani. Thanks for joining us. We love you too, man. Um, we, um, th I think the, the, the main disconnect always happens when you don't understand something. When you don't understand something, you're quickly to discard it as either dangerous or, um, or of no consequence, right? So what are, what are some ways that, that people can easily dip their toes into some of these leading edge technologies to try and get them thinking about them in a, in a practical way. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a lot of short courses out there now. Um, and just, uh, watching YouTube videos on them, just studying up on them. But, uh, I, I've been doing a whole lot of work on comparing all the different, uh, AI models and, uh, go in and ask the same question on, four or five different AI models and see, see which one gives me the best answer. And uh, some, of, some of them I get completely wrong answers. Some of them I um, uh, get things that are poorly worded or throw in some weird uh, thing that doesn't apply. Um, and, and so I keep going back to chat GPT. 
Um, it seems seems to be better than the others at the moment. Um, now I haven't done an exhaustive test on or, across the board, but I know that um, that this is this is actually giving me like superpowers. Um, I, I found that I can now uh, uh, crash out a business plan for a, a new startup business in less than an afternoon. Um, I can do the entire thing, and and it, it's well written and well well thought out. And this is something that would have taken me oh five six months in the past to to actually put this business plan together. So from the the standpoint of actually creating new businesses, I think we're going to start seeing this uh, just um, this explosion of of new businesses coming out of the woodwork. Um, and if, if for no other reason, um, then we can just get our ideas down on paper and we can actually make something seem real. That's, um, that's a gap that we, we haven't been able to cross very easily in the past. Jeremy, we need to get our thinking on paper business plan run through the same um, prompts just, just on that I, I assume that so that's the the uh, the pro version of chat gpt have you had any real success with any of the free versions the people who don't want to to pay monthly subscriptions um i i've i've just gone ahead and paid the subscription on everything um just because i don't want to wait around forever so <laughs> yeah um, Makes sense. If you're making a business plan, you've got to invest. Yeah. So yeah, forget that question. Yeah, I, I will. <laughs> I will tell you about an argument I got into with ChatGPT um, because I would. Oh, I, I had written this article about uh, some future interaction with a, a hologram of Adolf Hitler. Um, and anyway, this is a story that um, I came up with, and I thought it was pretty interesting. And so I wanted to get a picture uh, of Adolf Hitler's and. And it came back and says, no, that violates our terms of service because we can't, we can't give any um, uh, pictures of historical figures. And, and I, I thought about that for a bit and I said, oh, well, when did this start coming into play? And, and, and then so I asked, I says, okay, so then AI is not gonna be very good at teaching history in the future. And, and it, it came back and says, well, it's really good at teaching all these aspects of history here. And uh, I says, well, then, um, then an AI search engine is not going to replace a regular search engine because it's, it's not allowing you to get pictures of people in the past, but a regular search engine is. And, and they, they said, well, the, these, do two different, these are two different business models. And, and they did admit that this is a, a hot, hotly debated topic in the AI world right now about being able to um, render uh, lifelike pictures of historical figures. And part of the problem is the deep fake issue that, um, that we're going to be running into in an election year where somebody wants to use, uh, I don't know, George Washington or Abraham Lincoln to endorse one of the political candidates or maybe some mayor candidate in the middle of Illinois or something, but um, and and so I understand that. But I uh, I think um, they've created kind of a a major uh, major problem for the moment, and I'm not sure how they get past this. Is there have you run across anything, or have you thought about? Um, you know, like specific to deep fake, right? So there, there are people that can do very nefarious things by creating versions of the three of us saying very bad things or endorsing certain things, right? Is, is what is, what is like the cease and desist, the new version of cease and desist or cease and um, disassemble, right? Uh, in, the, in this new world, right? Where you see these deep fakes and do you see any technology coming out or any trends of technology coming together that could help us out with that? Well, it involves drones um, <laughs> showing up on your doorstep. I um, this is going to be a challenging issue all, all around. Um, there's there's going to be uh, various attempts at watermarks and um, labeling things as 
um, this is not real, that sort of thing. But uh, invariably, it's it, we're going to have all kinds of problems with this. Um, I, I always think in terms of uh, the dark web, uh, if, if, if we get it solved uh, above the surface, <laughs> there we go, then somebody certainly has a version on the dark web that allows you to do everything you're not supposed to be able to do. Um, and and, and so I, I see this being very challenging. Um, we'll probably have lots of regulations that come into play, but finding finding the people that are making these deep fakes is going to be challenging for sure. Yeah, I think I've talked about this, Mark, a bunch of times. Like, you know, there's there's got to be a way to send a signal from one computer to another to disassemble a piece of content, right? Like that that to me could be really interesting. But then it comes back to Thomas, like who gets to push the button on when to send that signal out? It always comes back to humans, right? Yeah. It also that to me initially, and it seems like a a long term problem to a very immediate problem, and maybe by the time that that kind of technology is available, maybe or maybe I'm completely wrong, it already is possible to get to that solution. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I, I wish there was, uh, we're, we're going to run into literally thousands of these types of issues. Um, and somebody's going to figure out how to, uh, I don't know, do something to, to steal somebody's trademark or work with their patent or whatever it might be in ways that uh, were never possible in the past. Um, I mean, it is it is possible to to use an AI um, program to actually uh, create ten different versions of your patent and send them all in, and you can get ten more patents on the same thing. Um, that that's that's entirely possible to do that, um, and so so the being able to 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 actually. Well, one of one of the new things that's out there is these programs that will actually nudify a photo. So you you take all these people that are dressed up at a conference, and then you can make everybody naked on there. Um, and that's that's um, making its rounds at the moment. I think somebody's going to figure out how to how to cancel that, but <laughs> we'll see. Well, I look forward to that um, expanding, uh, being all over LinkedIn in the next few weeks is that use of AI. Um, you've written about the, like the, the 12, you have like 12 laws, I believe, to understand futurism in a more, in a more, in a better way. Yeah. Um, did the, will those 12 laws help us and help brands to understand and react to these incoming obstacles and could you talk us through maybe the, the most important of those 12 laws or your laws yeah um so the reason i wrote the 12 laws is to just as as a kind of way of, of stepping myself into the future as to how how do you think about each phase but you start asking the question okay where does the future come from is this is it assembling itself somewhere over here is it um is it 50 frames per second. I don't know how how this the the future is being assembled over here, and then where is it being stored? What's the pipeline? And then suddenly we experience the present, and then it goes away. Where does where does the future that was created? Where does that go? Is that in some crash bin over here? Um, see, I, I think of the future uh, from the perspective of the laws of physics. Uh, we, we haven't had any physicists that really have spent time on thinking about our relationship with the future. Um, we, we think about our relationship with uh, inanimate objects, with people, with everything that we can see around us. But we're all going to be entering the future um, and we're all leaving the present at the same, the same rate of speed, moving into the future. And so what happens to all of that that we experience and go, how, do, how, does, it, how does it get disposed of? Where does it go? Um, these, these are uh, lots of crazy, interesting questions that we like to play around with. And so, um, so when, we, 
we can anticipate a lot of small changes based on current momentums. Um, these are different trend lines. So like if a pitcher is pitching a ball, each, each tenth of a second, you can see that hand move a little bit farther forward. Um, and you pretty much can anticipate how long it's going to take to get to the, the final stage. Um, and so we have lots of uh, things that are currently in motion that are unfolding around us. Now, as, as we experience all those things, other things are starting to catch on and they're changing at the same time. So that that's just kind of a way of explaining uh, kind of the changes that we all intuitively know about, but we rarely actually think about all the, the details involved in it. So two things that come to mind is one is a giant bin of uh, unactualized futures that uh, maybe would be fun to access at some point in time. So that's the one thing. But then if we use that sports analogy, right, and we have the pitcher and it's a snapshot of where his hand position is right here, what are the three things? Now, we're extrapolating this out to the to predicting the future, not just the future of how this ball is going to land in a glove. But if there were three things like direction, spin, whatever, what would be the three things that are the big trends that are in, that are influencing – the next potentially actualized future. Um, yeah, the um, well, the fact that this person is in this uh, this space at this time, um, and the the fact that they're actually personally involved in this, they, they can't be in another place. They can't be involved in something else, and. And the, their mind is totally engaged on that particular act. Um, those are uh, pieces of this. Um, I'm thinking you're probably wanting something different, but there's um, there's lots of different ways of looking looking at this. Um, so if we yeah maybe maybe approach it another way. So if these like these points of influence these data points, not just, so if you look at data points like population growth, maybe like um, uh, education rates, maybe some of those demographic kind of, kind of inputs. And then we also look at the technologies, which are like AI, which are AR, which are blockchain, which are all of these things. How do those, um, those data points interact to kind of help us point, help us know where that ball is going? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I think the uh, the data from the what's what's actually taking place um, kind of actually uh, stands on its own. But there's there's other things happening at the same time. Um, the how do how is the wind changing? How is, how is the the breaking through the um, Oh, kind of the the time barriers and and uh, how how does some little extra twist at the end make it different than anything else he's thrown earlier? Um, and then how many uh, how many throws does that arm have in it over a lifetime? And uh, where's the countdown clock saying that? Well, you just used up one of your ten thousand. 25 different throws that you're going to make in your lifetime. Um, so uh, there, there's lots of different ways of looking at this. More, more butterfly effect kind of stuff, right? That, with, right. that, that influence. So one, one thing I want to lean back in on is, is the future of education. Cause you write about this a lot and I'm continually troubled for many reasons by the, by our education system. Um, and you talk about uh, this, this was maybe an older article, but you talk about just in case, learning coupled with just in time world which i think is i think is really interesting what what so i know there are people out here with kids right i've got kids mark's got kids you know there are other people looking to change careers what should fourth graders major in today to be ready for where we're headed <laughs> could i just for our english fans <laughs> enough of the a baseball analogy okay lost on that one how old is a fourth grader oh good question 10 I think 10, nine or yeah. 10, nine, 10, 11. Yeah. Okay. 
I, I like that. I like that question. And can, can we actually maybe expand that a bit? Because my, my son is four, so can we take it all the way down to four? Like, what should we be thinking as parents? Yeah, where should we be encouraging their encouraging their curiosity? Yeah, um, this is such a hot debate among parents right now. And incidentally, I think the hardest job in the world right now is being a parent. Um, how much screen time should the kids have? Uh, is VR okay for young kids? Is it is it dangerous? Um, all the other kids are doing it, so why shouldn't I be doing this? Um, at what age should you buy a, a cell phone for your kids? Um, and I too. <laughs> good, good luck with that, Mark. <laughs> I'm a dreamer. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I saw this real interesting uh, little video clip about a kid saying, yeah, I, I know my, my fellow students have gotten in trouble for um, using AI to do their homework. And, uh, and that's, that's not, not legal. Um, but why shouldn't it be legal? Because we're going to be using this the rest of our lives. And, uh, and so part of the problem is, is teachers don't understand the technology. Um, they don't understand what we're moving into. And so we actually need to teach the kids how to be really good at all of this, a cutting edge technology. Um, and, and actually, um, how to become this, this will sound bad, but actually how to become obsessed with it. Um, it's the people that really have stood out over the last 20 years or so, um, the unicorn class of entrepreneurs, uh, these, these are the people that were totally obsessed with, with what they were doing. And, uh, and it ended up paying off in a big way. So, so it, with, with, Going back to your question about what should they be focused on right now, um, I think they should find what things they're passionate about and just dive in and do it. Uh, I, I I think it's okay to spend a lot of extra time on screen time. I think it's okay to spend a lot of time on VR, um, but you have to read the signals at the same time. When when is something going off? Uh, kind of sliding off the table and shouldn't be. Yeah. And I think you talk about this too, that, you know, that while, while some jobs will, will go away due to automation, that that's been happening for centuries, right. As technology gets better, um, you know, factory technology and all other kinds of technology, but human centric, um, traits and qualities are, are, probably going to be in motion for the, the, the near and hopefully long-term future, right? So communicating really well, uh, having empathy, um, you know, figuring out how to use the tech uh, between disciplines, right? So I always think like going back to the fourth grade question, I mean, it's got to come back to like psychology. It's got to come back to philosophy a little bit. It's, does it come back to, um, you know, physics, right? Is yeah. where, where do we do, what do we do with that? Yeah, and, and also what's real and what isn't real. This this is real tricky um, because uh, do we have flying cars today? Uh, what state are they in? Um, how far have they progressed? Where are flying cars being used today? We see all these headlines announcing, yes, these are the new flying cars that just just got introduced, but nobody's using them. So why, why is that? And... Uh, and if we have flying cars, um, is, are governments going to allow flying cars to just take off from anywhere? <laughs> so are you are you referring to that book, Where's My Flying Car? Have you read that one? <laughs> I have, yeah. I can, I, so I thought that was really fascinating, right? Because the technology, was, technology to have flying cars was there like back in the 50s, right? Or something around then, but it was a lot of government uh regulation that held them back it was a lot of previously existing industries that didn't yeah. want to see that industry develop like so externally there's a lot of influence on what could happen with the next innovation right yeah the the curtis air car actually was around in i think 1917 or something like that uh, basically they just put wings on a regular car and, and flew it around a little bit uh it was never practical it was never going to catch on but um yeah. So one one thing 
It reminds me of that flying cars of planes. Didn't we have that from one of our one of our previous shows? With, with with so automated cars, electric cars. It's one of the biggest talking points. I, th I think I was reading a statistic the other day that five years ago there was literally no electric cars in California. Now they're twenty or twenty five percent of all cars, and so there's obviously a massively quick spread of this. Right. How? What what, do, what is the immediate and long-term future of automated cars and automated transport systems? What does that look like for you? How, how, how do you think about that? I know it's one of your specialities. Yeah. Um, so autonomous vehicles, um, I think, have to be electric. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't see a car that is uh, a robotic car that pulls up to a gas station, reaches out and grabs the pump and puts it into the tank and fills it up. That just seems way too messy. Uh, an electric car seems like it could recharge itself much easier. Um, so one one question that was asked of Elon Musk was, what what forms of data does he have access to that nobody else has access to? And he said that he has he has access to to first X, um, formerly Twitter, and so he has all that data, and then he also has um, he has cameras on every car that he has sold, so he's able to tie what the car is seeing on the camera with what actions the driver is taking. So while that seems like unstructured data, they're actually figuring out how to make it structured. So Tesla will very likely be the compendium of data for all the, the autonomous vehicles in the future. And, um, and people are gonna have to subscribe to that. All the different car companies will have to subscribe to that uh, to get theirs to drive the best. And so I, I see this coming right around the corner here pretty pretty soon um it's turned into a hard much harder problem to solve than most people thought um but there there are so many variables when you're driving down the street um, uh i think there there's all the the balls flying across the road the cats and the dogs and the and, and does, the, does the car hit grandma or does the car hit the cat is the big you know that's the human question too right yeah, well, those are those are those weird edge cases that nobody really cares about because there's they happen so infrequently that uh, uh, like one one every trillion accidents <laughs> you run into something like that. Um, but it, it it becomes an interesting debate topic, but it's really not that practical. What's what's more practical is is this car safer? um having a machine drive it rather than actually having people drive it and that's actually a fairly low barrier to cross uh human drivers are are pretty terrible um and i, I having just spent the last two weeks driving around england and france i can confirm <laughs> Well, Thomas, one, one thing that you said is really interesting, right? Because, you know, you, you always try to think about, you know, what do computers do better than humans? What do humans do better than computers? And what computers don't have that humans do is is the the emotional side, the limbic connections and, and all of that things, at least at least yet. Right. So is that why their computers are better drivers than people? Less. Um, well, we're less distracted. I mean, we, we live in a very distracted society. Um, yeah, every every three seconds we have to figure out if our phone is buzzing again or uh, somebody's calling us or, uh, yeah, we smell something different. Yeah, we're just kind of constantly on edge. Um, and so we're, we're such a distraction. And very, 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 very slow at processing information and reacting to it. <laughs> it's, it's better if you are slow. <laughs> um, however, if you're in a, a critical situation with a car, that, that can be uh, a real game changer. So one thing I have to remind people of is that the cars that we drive today have actually been in development for the past 120 years. Um, it's taken that long to get to cars that are this good. And, and if you think about it, 
much of the other technology that we're using today is has been in development for almost as long, whether it's a TV camera, whether it's uh, televisions, whether it's headphones, music players, anything, that, any electronic device in your house has, has been evolving and changing constantly. We, we virtually have uh, no electronic devices in our house that are over 10 years old. Um, yeah, can, can you think of one in your house that's over 10 years old, an electronic device? Um, the, the only one that I can think of is the extension cord. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's a heavy calculator. <laughs> yeah, a World War II calculator. <laughs> Yeah, for those who just listened to this, I just held up a, 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 a an old Casio calculator from a long time. Yeah, but other than that, no. Yeah, so um, we're we're const constantly evolving and changing. Now it's interesting to look at the people that have been designing cars in the past, um, because there's been so much work spent on designing a car by understanding the human relationship with the steering wheel, the human relationship with the pedals on the floor, with uh, the dashboard, all of those things, those uh, anthropometric measurements that are taken to get everything exactly right. Now, as we move into um, a driverless vehicle, then suddenly the people that are designing that are no longer worried about all of this data that we've accumulated about the human relationship with the steering wheel and the pedals. All of that goes out the window. They're involved in thinking about other aspects of the car, but not that. And so is it the same job? And uh, and this, this comes into play again and again and again in virtually every other industry as we start outdating different aspects of the work that's being done. So I, I find that, that to be quite fascinating because our jobs are continually evolving and pieces of the work that we've been doing in the past go away and we, uh, we actually reinvent the job and reinvent the work that's being done. But it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a different world that we're entering into though. So the data collection and aggregation and uh, application, future application of, of those data sets, I don't have a Tesla, so I don't know the, the rules and how it all works, but it, are you able to opt out of that data collection? Or is that just kind of like a work for hire agreement when Mark goes into a studio to sing a song for a toothpaste brand? <laughs> I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure, but I think that, I think that that's part of how the car operates, um, that they, they just have access to that data. When it, well, the reason why yeah, by, by, by buying the car, you agree to all terms and conditions. I would probably imagine. one of the contracts that you just swipe down to get to the bottom really quickly. Yeah. Well, one trend that I think about, Thomas, and I'd be curious to get your thoughts on this is uh, as far as the future goes, the 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 whole self-sovereign identity kind of thing and controlling your your personal data stores and and applying those and, and letting other people have access to them, but for the right uh, compensation. What are you seeing there and how important is that trend going to be? Yeah. Um, so I've actually written quite a few articles on the next gold rush is going to be uh, people that figure out new troves of data to tap into. Um, but um, so if you think about somebody in the future, um, they wake up and they start talking back and forth with their AI. Um, and I think about it as a buddy bot. And this buddy bot is something that you just have a normal conversation with. It's asking you questions, asking how your day is, and, and you're constantly interacting with your buddy bot. Now, the buddy bot has, um, it, it becomes your cheerleader, your champion. It's the guardian of your privacy. It, uh, it has... Uh, an obligation to protect you in any way that it can. Now, then it also has uh, uh, another bot that's part of part of who you are. And it's an assessment bot that's assessing everything that you're consuming. Um, and so if you're reading a book, 
um, it assigns micro credits to how much you're reading. And if you're watching a movie or if you're listening to podcasts, it's assigning micro credits to all the things that you're, all the information you're consuming. Now, the average person is consuming over 12 hours of information every day. Um, and so we're, we, we don't get any credit for that, though. Now, if you think about people wearing smart glasses um, and being able to actually, re the glasses that record everything that we see and everything that we hear, and with a few other sensors, it can capture the entire life experience, everything we touch and feel and taste and smell. And so all of that can be um, stored in this compendium, this personal cloud that we have access to. Now, sometime in the future, we should be able to have an interface with that personal cloud where we can just go back and uh, what was that book that I read 10 years ago on page 213, the fourth paragraph down, that was such an interesting phrase that they used. And you can, can uh, recall that exactly the way it was, was originally written. Um, I think this is, this. is we're, we're moving down this path where we're going to be creating this personal cloud of all this information that we've um, that we've consumed over the years. And, and so then um, who should have access to our personal cloud? And, uh, and we, de we decide that on our own. And, uh, and, you know, the uses for our personal cloud data today are going to be different than they are 10 years from now. Um, so what seems like a legitimate use for it today may not be legitimate a while, while later. So <laughs> these things get but real is complicated. This, is this where our friend and savior blockchain web three comes into this conversation? Um, yeah, I know a lot of, a lot of our listeners are web three based. So I think, yeah, it's well, maybe yeah, the, the blockchain certain, through. certainly. Um, it'll be categorized in some form of a blockchain that all of this data gets stored there. Um, but the, the personal um, information, the personal data like this, I think is, um, I, I think that's going to be pretty low value. Um, well, unless you're like a celebrity that everybody wants to know about. Um, but for, for most people, I don't see that there's much, much value in it. Uh, if you're thinking or you're going to get rich because uh, you're going to sell your personal data, I don't, I don't think that's going to work that way. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think there's like there's certain situations where I think certain people's data can be valuable to certain brands. Right. And but right now it's just kind of getting getting grabbed and used, you know, as we click through the terms and conditions because we're balancing uh you know the the convenience with security and and falling on convenience versus security um one question i, I think one opportunity um that it would be really interesting is the indexing if companies are uh, are looking to build something they should build indexing capabilities for these personal data stores because data is data but like index data with with kind of a, a qualification allows us to use it, right? That's why people struggle with these big data stores. Right, right. Um, so so I, was, I was speculating on what other kinds of data would be really valuable in the future. So as an example, if somebody ac actually created a probe that has lots of sensors on it and they were able to put it in the sewer systems underneath maybe 500 major cities around the world, and this would be this constant data stream of uh, how the, the the sewage is changing, and whether there's um, uh, what what type of uh, food changes or people's diets are changing, um, if there's any diseases passing through the city, where it's getting started, what parts of the cities that's taken place, and and. Um, and, I, and I'm just scratching the surface. I'm sure there's thousands of different things you could determine just from the sewage part of it. So somebody who would actually um, set up a company just for that type of data, they're going to be making uh, huge amounts of money just selling that data. 
And, and so if you go down that path, you can start thinking in terms of, well, what if I get a bunch of people to actually um, monitor their sleep at night and can we sell that data? Um, how about um, how people move on their mattresses at night? Uh, can we sell that data? And then um, how are people interacting with their dogs? Uh, can we have sensors all over dogs? What, what's that going to look like? And how do dogs interact with robot dogs? Um, it's a good question. <laughs> There's a lot of amazing insight there because I think that that you often read about in the future where these systems will know you better than you know yourself. So how you interact with your dog will give huge information on your psychological state at any given moment and how you sleep obviously will give huge information about your current physical state and then okay okay so there's the, the day that you get a serious illness and it would take a doctor two years to find out the information that is gathered around you the data can you know in, increase your insurance bill by 25 percent or you, decrease your life insurance and there's a lot of um, downstream effects of this kind of tech yeah that's why I've thrown my Fitbit away. I no longer uh, <laughs> give my information to, to Google. Um, if you think about sometime in the future, we're going to be able to have, sit down and we're reading a book. And the book is actually reading us at the same time we're reading the book. And, and so, so then it will make changes in the book based on a reaction to different things. It will change the way the ending happens in the book. And, and so it gives you a totally different ending than your friends that read the same book a little while ago. Um, and that can be the same as on uh, a movie you go to and the movie rewrites itself uh, as you're going through it. It can be a whole room full of people and it's reading the entire audience and changing it on the fly. Uh, I find that to be quite interesting. It's almost like that that is a can of worms of questions <laughs> there because um what well, I don't I don't think Quentin Tarantino is gonna let you change the end of his film depending on the mood of the viewer. Um, <laughs> well think about the context of this where you know uh Todd Rundgren and Radiohead and you know Nine Inch Nails uh released their stems so their individual music tracks for other people to mix right to other people to interpret and while the tracks were encoded they can't change the tracks but you can change like how they're combined right so are we looking at like the quantum mechanical version of uh story and ip experiences like different wave function collapses when mark looks at it when you look at it like you know that could be interesting, but diabolical at the same time. We're supposed to be staying. We're supposed to be staying happy and anti dystopian at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're you're listening to music, uh, it can read your reaction to the music, and if um, and if you suddenly you start looking depressed or something, it can switch to a different song and bring your mood back up again. Um, I think that that's entirely doable, and I think that's going to be coming out rather soon here. Um, there'll be a, a future where one of the, the the most valuable assets in the future of any kind of entertainment will be that it's made by a human. Not not whether you can tell that it is or it isn't, or that the fact that it is, and somehow you'll be able to prove that it is. And maybe so with the example of the books and the movies and the music, you'll have one one part of the world where okay, you can change the ending, you can change parts of it based on emotional reaction, etc. And then you have this other section of culture where it is leave alone and you can't and you can experience both it's that it's not a zero-sum game is it there is room for both yeah. possible outcomes that's yeah in, to think in virtually it. every case we're gonna um be doing both um so are we gonna go to car races that are uh where humans are racing or car car races where it's all driverless vehicles racing against each other <laughs> um we we love to to see humans compete um but um are we are we going to buy artwork that is um that has some robot that helps make the art or just strictly human-based art um it uh, in virtually all these cases we'll we'll do both um will we have machine made music or will we have human made music or combinations of both again we'll, we'll mainly do both 
I, I had my, I asked my wife the question, I says, would you rather have, have sushi that's um, prepared by a human chef or would you rather have sushi that's prepared by a robot? And she thought about it for a while and she says, she says, well, I, I think I'd rather have the human because they're, um, I, I prefer the inconsistencies that go along with it. Mm. Um, in her mind, um, a, a robotic chef is something that's perfect every time. And, uh, and that was less than optimal. Well, robots can't smell when the fish has gone bad either. Right. Uh, they might be able to in the future, but I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Be, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so Thomas, this has been really interesting and, and definitely appreciate the discussion and insight, time and energy. I want, I'd love Mark, if you're open to this, I'd love to, to end on like a quick hot button exercise. Um, okay. so, uh, in, in, as we talk, you know, I love as hot we buttons, talk about so these, yeah, these, yeah, these, these trends and predictions, let's try and like, keep it to, you know, a, a, a quick sentence or two about each one. But what I'd like you to do is present us with three predictions. Okay. okay. And each prediction, I want you to present us with your conviction scale related to that conviction. So, uh, a prediction with a one person, a one, uh, conviction scale means that you're not too too keen on it one with a 10 percent or 10 conviction scale means you know it's certain to happen in your mind so one trend add a conviction scale number from zero to ten okay so a prediction um the okay the i was going to do something on the human population but it's uh uh, that one's a little too complicated and it takes too much time. Um, yeah, the pre my prediction is, is that we're going to have more jobs in the future than we know what to do with. Conviction scale. Um, nine. Okay. Um, Trend number two or prediction number two. I hope that, I hope that, I hope that's right because that's, goes counter to most of the discussion that you hear. Um, yeah. Um, the next prediction is that we're going to be moving to an era where most of the medical interface will be self-diagnostic. Uh, we'll be using machines to diagnose what's wrong with us. Conviction uh, scale? Uh, probably an eight on that one. Okay. Final one. Um, and that we're, we're going to be finding uh, a cure for obesity. Um, and conviction scale on that's probably uh, a six or seven. Okay. Awesome. Could I, I like, I like this game. Could I just add a couple that have just come into my mind? Maybe that some, I'll say something and you say kind of how likely okay. or unlikely you, you think my prediction is. So based on a few things that I was writing at the end of last year. So the first person to live to 200 years old has been born. Not likely. Okay. Um, autonomous tractors will be a regular sight in the British countryside by the, by 2050. Um, that'll, that'll be pretty likely. Okay. Um, I can't think of anything else I've been right about, but I like, I those like are great. Answers. Those are great. And that great insights, uh, Thomas and, and, you know, definitely appreciate your time and energy. Um, any yeah. closing, is in clo any closing thoughts for our audience? Well, uh, I'll just go to the, your aging question there. Um, I had a, a friend of mine come up to me and said, uh, isn't it true that the person, uh, the first person to live forever is currently alive today? And I, I, I told him, I says, you know, that's kind of a stupid uh, prediction because, um, first of all, you'd have to live longer than the person that's going to live forever. And we'll never know. <laughs> and so, so zero consequence of a bad prediction in that case. Yeah. And so living, living to be a hundred years old, we haven't figured out how to live past 120 yet. Um, and just getting over, over a hundred is barely doable. And so, uh, we, we have a long ways to go to get to, uh, 
yeah, I'm 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 reading a lot of stuff on this right now, but we still have a long ways to go. Well, extension of life doesn't always mean quality of life too. So that that comes into the equation too. Um, exactly. with it. Uh, again, the human piece meeting the tech piece. Um, but Thomas, we're uh, we're thankful that you were able to join us today. Uh, your insights were awesome. Uh, we'll, Mark will be doing a, a nice write up at the tail end of this thing. Uh, Disruptors and Curious Minds, thanks for listening. If you don't know about our book club yet, you really need to check it out. Um, last book was Nexus, written by Julio Otino. We, are we releasing our, our book now? Or are we going to tease it out, Mark? Or do you want to wait? Just, just, no, let's go. The, 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 name name the book, Jeremy. Go the for Design it. of Everyday Things is the next book uh, in the Thinking on Paper book club. www.thinkingonpaper.xyz slash book club. Jump in there and hear all the details. Thanks again to our friends at Ripple, W-R-I-P-P-L-E.com marketing's on-demand talent platform, stacking teams for your interdisciplinary projects as we move towards the anti-dystopian future. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but that's it for us today. Thanks for joining. Mark, closing thoughts before we get out of here. Um, no closing thoughts on that. I'm going to um, write a big write-up on it. Just our next week's guest is Marcus Thelim, who's the author of Crypto Titans, How Trillions Were Made and Billions Lost in the Cryptocurrency Market. So next week, we're going down the cryptocurrency rabbit hole, which in light of the current bull talk is going to be very exciting. And then the week after that, we have a tech lawyer and we've got another futurist, I think Alexandra Whittington, which I think um, you perhaps you perhaps know her, Thomas. So yes, yeah, some very exciting guests for season two. Amazing. Stay disruptive, stay curious, and keep thinking on paper. Take it easy. Bye. All right.